quiet on the set. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Hello, everybody. I'm Dear Myrtle, your friend in genealogy, and I don't know why I have that backdrop for last night's um, Intermediate Foundation Salt Lake Institute course. I promise you that the content we're going to be providing tonight's a lot better than the mistake I just made there. Um, this topic um, involves client reports, but in this case, you are the client. Why should we reserve client reports where we summarize what we think about a single document or what we have uh, assimilated or acquired and analyzed and correlated and, and everything in the way of a research question that might involve multiple documents, um, why are we not giving ourselves these same research reports that a professional might give us if they had done the research? I mean, I want to do professional research, don't you, Cousin Raz? I'd like to think that my outcome will be, I won't say professional, but in that direction. In that direction. And it reflects your current thinking. And it's a springboard for future research. And it, it just puts down on paper, digital or otherwise, what you believe to be true based on these documents, etc. Now, before we get into this, if Gary is here, raise your hand, Gary, so that you can join the panel. Um, hopefully, he will be joining us shortly. I do see him there. Thank you, uh, because it's your fault, Gary, that we're discussing this. Uh, also, um, Thomas McKenty made it known today that he discovered that genealogy standards is now, in fact, available in the Kindle version. This is one of those rare times when the Kindle version is more expensive than the paperback version. There we go. <laughs> okay, your, your video works, Gary, and your mic. Okay. Uh, excellent. Okay, so let me give you all this link, Cousin Russ, so that you can share it with um, the community uh, because this is good news. Um, I like having um, evidence explained in digital format. Um, then I can quickly search for things. All right, now I'm going to explain a little bit about what we're doing tonight with this short um, seven slides and well, actually, there's six of them. Every client report needs to have a heading. It kind of looks like letterhead at the top. I kind of fake some letterhead. And as when you use Microsoft Word, you notice that the header becomes faded out <coughs> slightly. But of, of course, it prints out beautifully. But the date and who you're sending the report to, and that can certainly be yourself, the subject of it, the question, and the task. Now the question and the task can sometimes be confusing. Um, let's see what the, from your point of view, anybody on the panel, what's the difference between the question that we're planning to give a report on and the task? Any ideas on that? I would have, I could have multiple tasks to answer the question. Mm -hmm. You most certainly could. Uh, and, and let's see if that pans out. We've got three examples tonight and we're gonna um, dissect some work that other people have done uh, that's available freely on the web. Now, here are some things I'd like you to keep an eye out for as we look at these three distinctly different kinds of client reports. Uh, one is how they organize their data. Uh, they may have included a transcript. Bulleted lists help set things apart from the previous item. Tables work really well, and one of them will see where property was sold on a certain date. Here's the grantee, here's the grantor, and there's the price paid. And a table works beautifully when you're doing a house history. Timelines work well. Uh, we've had entire uh, webinars, one most recently uh, with our Dr. Shelley. Uh, she 
really helps us understand the use of timelines. They're very effective in these client reports. Client reports may also require us to clarify some of the definitions that we have in our report. For instance, if you know that your client, and your client could be you, you may have had to look up some legal definitions or find out what the status of a widow was at a certain point in this place on the face of the earth at a certain time. So it may be very different from our 21st century point of view. And any other things that you may decide to add to put historical context um, into the mix. So, the, but, it, but basically I'll call that the clarification of content that you decide to include. Um, we've got some comments already. Um, no, what, no. I, I agree with Betty Lou, the task could include where you want to look for the answer. Could be a research plan. Yes, so good for you. All right, so the first report <clears throat> that we're going to do is the report about one record, one single document. And we have derived this from a report to the Whitty Whitter Research Group by Elizabeth Schoen Mills back in 2011. It's freely available on her website, Historic Pathways. And when we get to that point, Cousin Russ will give you the link. Yeah, uh, Gary, do you want to mute your audio? Um, because we're getting feedback from you. So mute your mic. Thank you, dear. The second kind of report we're going to look at is um, derived from a house history that was a client report. Notice that I uh, withheld the client's name, as did she. Uh, it was back in 2007, and she permitted, uh, Connie Lindzen, who's a certified genealogist, um, got permission from her client to put this type of a client report up on the board for certification of, web, of a genealogist's website. And I chose it because A, it was a house history, and B, because she used multiple record types. She used house, uh, she used um, grantee grantor records, she used city directories, um, she used a, um, an obituary. And so in addition to giving you the citation from where I derived this form, uh, I've also given the exact link and, and when we get to that point, Cousin Russ will share it with you. Now both this first and second type, I've already created the form, but we're gonna go through the forms as if I haven't, and then I'll show you my results. Um, the third one we're going to actually dissect together. And I picked it because it was pro bono, but it's still very professional. This also was published on the Board for Certification of Genealogists website. This time, Melissa Ruffner was the author. And she used a cover letter, which is something the other two reports did not do. But it could certainly apply in any situation. So that's our plan for tonight, and I hope that this makes sense to you. Okay, any questions before we get going? We're good, I think. We're good. Okay, so here's the first thing we're going to look at. That's that one single document. This is how Elizabeth Schoen Mills um, presented her report. So she's got her letterhead at the top, right? She's got the date, who she's reporting to, the subject, now let's look at the difference between her question and her task. So was the soldier the same man as Samuel Whittier, 1787 to 1876, enumerated in Franklin County, Pennsylvania, and these other several places? And our task is to, because apparently he was in an enlistment record and we're analyzing that enlistment record. The task is to analyze the document 
and prepare a work plan based on the clues therein? I, I, I think that, well, one thing about the question, mm -hmm. very, you would think that you had a generic question, but that's not the case. Our questions should be very specific mm -hmm. with the information that you have, because that helps you uh, separate Samuel Whittier, Witter from another Samuel mm -hmm. Witter who might be the same name, same place, same time, but enough information that you can tell the difference between the two. So the, it's not find who the parents of Samuel Witter is, mm -hmm. Samuel Witter who is here, here and here, uh, you know, put some meat behind your question. So you can be a focused question like we, you, we've we talked before about focused research, mm -hmm. but the focused question helps you do a focused research. At least I find that to be true. I, I think you're right. Um, it's it, the question in a simplistic, not very helpful format would be, um, is this Samuel Witter of the 17th U.S. Infantry War of 1812 my Samuel Whit Witter. Right, right. We need to let this report stand on its own. So the way that we distinguish who my guy is, and it, it, this is actually Elizabeth's challenge, is it the same Samuel that we know of as Samuel Witter, who lived to be uh, to 1896, and he was enumerated in Franklin County, Pennsylvania, Bedford County, Pennsylvania, and then Lawrence County, Illinois. Um, and um, so that's the difference. Is it our Samuel Witter, or is it this guy with all these other things that we already know to be true about him? Um, Gary, I got to tell you, <laughs> I normally have a very distant cousin come and do these um, evening uh, when, Wacky Wednesdays, but Cousin Russ said I should do it tonight. That way I get all the blame if we mess up tonight. <laughs> so <laughs> I can't blame it on any of my very distant cousins. No okay. problem. Okay. All right. So we're on the same page about this. Now we're going to go forward with elements um, the document so remember she's got an enlistment record for war of 1812 so how i reviewed this report was to look at the fact that she indented the word the document and then she describes it and now i'm looking for the next indent analysis and then I'm looking for the next indent, which is possibly conflicting data. So it's all centered that her, her categories of uh, providing information in this report are by her design centered, bold text and underlined. And we've got Compatible data as another one of those categories that she's trying to bring forth in this. And then we have a category of possibly compatible data. Then <laughs> seemingly incompatible data. So seemingly is less possibly problematic than, well, See, what, tell me the difference in your mind. Maybe, Melissa, you're here. What's, does possibly sound like it's more compatible? Um, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> or, or as my friend Judy says, it depends. <laughs> it depends. I know. Yeah. All right. And seemingly incompatible data. And that's without going into deep research. It's just like, how could that be possible? Um, if he enlisted in Kentucky when we knew him to always be a Pennsylvania guy and then finally out to Illinois. Um, and let's see if there are any more categories. Clues to be pursued. Notice there's a to-do list up in that other category. as a subcategory. Notice that there are all kinds of footnotes going on. 
but I'm still just looking at those main centered and underlined things. Whoops, this is not underlined, but I think it should be. The work plan, at least it's centered, so I found it easily. And we'll go through all of those things and then she signs it with her initials at the end. So there's an eight page report to the Whittier Research Group just about this one enlistment record. Okay, what is our, um, what is your take on this initially? I'll pull up my Microsoft Word document and we'll go from there. Gary, what are you thinking about this? Well, one of the things that comes to mind here is I, I perfectly understand the physical description of the document and the analysis. Mm -hmm. But when it comes down to the categories of possibly conflicting data, compatible data, and so on, I'm wondering if these are a personal choice or rather um, something that, that has been established elsewhere. Well, Mark, do you have the, your three color codes? Because I think that may answer the question indirectly. Okay. Yes. Let's have an indirect um, answer to that question. So you mean this one? Uh, let me mean the green, yellow, and red? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So let me start my video. I fixed my background. So you're saying, tell me how this relates, like the proof um, statement, proof summary, proof argument. It depends upon what issue you're trying to address. The one with all the detail that Elizabeth has is that bottom one where you have to get into the nitty gritty. It's not a simple question or problem to resolve. It's very detailed. And if we were to read that report by Elizabeth, we would see that there was a lot of stuff going on and a lot, of, a lot of analysis that had to be done. So we had to go into more detail. But a right. simple a simple question that's easy to answer, uh, you may not need to have all the categories. Right. If the If our research problem if the question was, is this our, is, is, you know, who is this? Does it relate to our known Samuel Witter? Um, and it says directly in the, in the document, this is Samuel Witter, who used to live in these three counties in Pennsylvania, but he hasn't yet moved to Illinois because the War of 1812 had to happen in between. Um, then it directly, I mean, right then and there, you had a simple correlation of that document because you could triangulate on more than just the guy's name. Let me give another example that I use uh, for this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I had a, I, my question was, who is the parents of David Ridgely Howard? Mm -hmm. That was my question. And I did a lot of research to I had census records. I had a bunch of records that did not answer that question. But when I went to the cemetery, in one of the records, I said he was buried in a certain in Green, Greenmount Cemetery in Baltimore, Maryland. Mm -hmm. When I went to that cemetery, there was a plot record for the plot. And when I went to the plot, the headstone said, father, mother, David Ridgely Howard. So the plot was the family and that plot, the cemetery record and the layout of the headstones answered the question, who was David Ridgely Howard? So I would not necessarily have to write that whole document that Elizabeth says. I could provide the records that I use to come to the, to answer the question that I looked at all these other questions, other records to get to that cemetery. I had to find a record that says he was buried in the cemetery. When I went to the cemetery, found the plot record, I was able to write that in there, answer that very specific question. Right. And in Dr. Jones's book, Mastering Genealogical Proof, he explains 
that if you just have one item that directly answers the question, like the cemetery record in the sextant's office and the which also stipulates the layout of those plots. That's just one document, no conflicting evidence. It could be true or false, but um, that's all you're reporting on. If you're reporting on one that doesn't directly state, like those census records where you kind of think it could be, or because of the fan club, it kind of could be, he had got, you got into this more of a instead of a proof statement you're summarizing multiple documents that have information items that may answer your question by the time you get to the proof argument oh baby you've got okay. conflicting evidence to overcome and i mean hard conflicting evidence if it's just the spelling of a name with an e or no e then it's the second kind that um, Dr. Jones talks about in chapter seven of Mastering Genealogical Proof. In, in my example, I would have gone to that second item until I went to the cemetery. When I went to the cemetery, then my document becomes very quick, very clean because I have the answer on that document. Directly stated, right. Does um, that help, Gary? Yeah, so it, it helps. Uh, it helps a bit there. I'm starting to see a, a bit of the pattern here. What's not evident from the template is the three categories that uh, Myrtle was talking about. Okay, you get to call me Mert because you're one of my friends. <laughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> no, it's all right. I'm Mert. We have a question from Jan. Jan, I'm going to unmute your mic so you can ask the question. Okay. Jan, unmute your uh, your your mic, lower left hand corner of Zoom. Jan, can you hear us? Okay, she's. I can unmute her. I thought I could, but it won't. All right. I uh, I will put her back down. Okay. All right. We well. Did she pose the question by typing it or? Oh, she has her hand raised. Okay. All right. Usually when you raise your hand, it means you want to turn on your mic and you've got to unmute it yourself. Let me just drag this over just so you can see this. This is where, um, oh, actually they don't get to do it here because they're not on the panel. Oh, there she is. Now she is. All you have to do is click this. I'm going to mute myself. And then I unmute myself. So you need to click that button. Lower left hand corner of Zoom. Okay, so, but we do have a couple of other comments. Um, uh, yeah, Betty Lou, we've absolutely proved who we knew Sam, or actually she did. She knew that her Samuel Whittier, Witter, I keep saying Whittier because I have Whittier in one of my uh, my brother-in-law's lines. She had already done all the reasonably exhaustive research over years um, and knew that this was part of their Samuel Witter's profile, the different places he lived. Uh, okay, got something else for us? Yeah, Sarah says, yep, I think a report like this is only useful in the third category, long proof argument, most of the time, I can write a quick one or a two-sentence proof statement. Yep, yeah, that's perfectly fine. But the but I'm trying to express the ability to do any of these. All right. So in the cate, let's go through the categories in the document section. She. Um, um, explains what the enlistment um, record set is. It's part of record set from um, National Archives number uh, record group number 94. And this is the title of it, the pre-printed register. And then she has transcribed Samuel's information that he's a recruit, 
17th um, US Infantry, that he's five foot four inches, dark hair, dark eyes, dark color, and age 31, millwright. Occupation is frequently important. While, while you're on that screen on that part, what's important, what I take as, as important in the document that you showed us earlier where you had the law at the time, mm -hmm. what she did in square brackets, is that means that the editor, the person who put this document together, that's their comment. So the record mm -hmm. said R-E-C-T period. And she transcribed it because she knew the record and, and spelled it for us that recruit is what that stood for. So she's explaining the law, the, the information at the time that she's looking at. Yeah, that's um, good transcription practices. And we've had videos on that. Where it was blank, she noted that it was blank. Um, and unfortunately, this part, the town or county. All right, and then she gives remarks if there, are, and this was part of the original document. So this is all essentially a transcript. This report does not have the document attached. The last example we use tonight will have all the documents attached. Um, so we've got that. Mark, can I say something real quick? You bet about this particular section of the report. Um, mm -hmm. As an archivist, as a professional genealogist, this particular part I find very, very important because I find genealogists when they come into the archives and either they find a document in my archives or they have documents with them mm -hmm. looking for more documents. I find that sometimes I don't quite understand exactly what they have. And, that, and, and yes. I encourage them to transcribe the record because when you transcribe a record, it forces you to read every word and detail on that document. And it, it, I don't know about anybody else, but when I transcribe things for some reason, it gets better in my brain. Absolutely. Other, than, other than just looking at a document. And so, um, you know, really studying this document and there's, I can't tell you how many times I, when I was transcribing a document that I had already looked at already thought that I had torn apart mm -hmm. to find something new that I missed. Well, and I like to give the example of um, Bertie Holsclaw. All, she's deceased now, but she's a certified genealogist and she taught at IGHR. So she's pretty well recognized in the world of genealogy. She transcribed word for word, even if it was a printed document with the fill in the blanks typed. I do that too. So that you get the information. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Um, it also makes it possible for you to search your computer for an unusual word like Millwright um, or a funny name like Snicklefritz, in case you can't remember. Uh, yeah. Okay. Notice this. IR infantry roster. See how much she had to put in square brackets, cousin Russ, like you bring up. Good job. Okay, then she inserts a blank line and then she moves to the analysis. And in my example, I saw the two subcategories of the physical analysis. It was illegible, the photocopy was dark gray, scratch marks streaking across it. Sounds like it was um, image from microfilm, doesn't it? Um, and then um, content analysis. Um, Oh, one important factor about the physical thing was that it was not created at the time of the enlistment. One guide prepared by the National Archives provides the following background on the set. How important is that to understand, you know, what Mr. Ames did when he was doing the uh, compiled military service records for our uh, Civil War ancestors? Yeah. But in this, this is, case, this is 1812. Yes, this is yeah. very. This is a very important because humans are doing the transcribing, and we all make mistakes. Okay, and this is one document. Okay, then she yeah. does. Uh, yeah, Gary. Yeah. Um, yes, I. I was going to say the physical description is nice that it was broken out, but 
Um, the one thing that I think that I would personally want to put in there is exactly what you were talking about, is some of the background on the record. I was looking at a, um, at a discharge certificate for the Canadian Expeditionary Forces in the First World War. Mm -hmm. And on the back is, <clears throat> excuse me, on the back is a, uh, a notation, a uh, formal notation signed and such, showing the badge numbers that had been assigned to him. Now, most people don't even know that those badge numbers are a way of telling whether the person served, where an employer can tell if the person served is in the military. Now, if you didn't put that somewhere in this report, um, you would be missing something quite, quite substantial. Very Absolutely. valuable, yes. Yeah. Cousin Russ and I have situations where we've seen guys enlist we're not seeing a pension, we're not seeing bounty land, we're not seeing widow's pension. So did the guy really serve? Just because you enlist doesn't mean they actually took you. So um, that's a very valid point. And that's something that you get to inject here and explain it like you just explained it to old Mert here. Uh, then we deal with the uh, content analysis. Uh, okay, go ahead. Give me Deb's thing, and then we'll get back to our task. Yeah, Deb said I transcribed a death certificate last night. Wasn't for sure who the undertaker was, and Google undertakers in Reno 1919, and the funeral home came up in an ad in a newspaper in Reno for 1919. Then Betty Lou says, uh, that would bring into question is whether the age is based on the date of enlistment or discharge or another event. Mm -hmm. And Sarah says, I think giving historical context is important too. You shouldn't assume that your audience knows the uh, conflict detail and the audience in this case is ourself. Yeah. Um you know, when I have, when I'm quilting and I'm piecing together a square, a block as we call them, and I haven't done that particular design for 15 or 20 years, I'm going to look at the directions again because I don't quite remember how to put the pieces together so all the points match. Well, it's the, it's the same in any type of endeavor. We need to write this down, even though it's still only one document, so that we have that historical context and we know the quirky little things about numbers on the back, et cetera. So good. So, um, so in this case, when she's doing the analysis of the content, because it listed the date of um, age and things at a enlistment, both Samuels were born in 1878. Um, and, but, and so some of the pieces, you know, our known fellow migrated from Pennsylvania to Illinois. Some pieces of the data are possibly compatible, but one is certainly incompatible because I think he's in New York, isn't he? Isn't that what the, um, said he was born in the state. Where was this? Uh, oh, that he was enlisted in Kentucky, excuse me. You could conceivably go into Kentucky because of the Ohio River getting from um, Pennsylvania to Illinois. It's conceivable, but it could be conflicting because we, yeah, all right. So then, so then um, possibly conflicting data that she hasn't even done the research yet. She hasn't done any more than look at this document, but she's saying, hey, wait a minute. He was discharged early at the end of the war. Um, was the 1814 date of enlistment an error? Considering the extent to which companies and regiments consolidated during the war, that would mean she had specific knowledge of the War of 1812. The 1814 date might represent the date he joined the 17th he was already in another unit and now is being consolidated into the 17th, which is the unit. Um, 
earlier um, service from 1810 might exist. So it's like we're sitting around, you've got the document on the table, you've got Gary and Melissa and cousin Russ and a few people that are experts on 1812. And we're chewing the fat and we're saying, well, what do you think about this document? Because this is what we know up here on the marker board about our proven Samuel Whitter. And, and we're just brainstorming ideas. But do you see how she used um, the categorization of possibly conflicting and then a bulleted list? If this were in paragraph format, we might miss that middle item. So the bulleted list is a, is a trick you can use. So she's saying um, to help resolve this, here's a to-do list. And look at the US statutes at large to find out what the enlistment laws were for that 18, you know, there's your list of things that, that as we sat around chewing the fat and brainstorming, we'd say, well, you gotta check this, you gotta check that. Um, it just happens that she knew what had or had not been microfilmed. And when we <clears throat> use a word processing program and insert footnotes, they move along if you have to go back up to page two and add another bulleted item under the physical description, for instance. Um, okay. There's different things about his occupation, that it's compatible. This is compatible data. Millwright, doesn't matter how it's spelled. The birthplace was the same, Pennsylvania, for both men. Um, and she mentions the documents that she looked at to support that. Their physical description, somewhat the same. Possibly compatible data. And it has to do with tombstones, like you, Cousin Russ. And then some things that are seemingly incompatible, like it doesn't seem compatible that he enlisted in Kentucky. Um, he, because he should have been in Franklin County, Pennsylvania, that's where Dolly Yaki was said to have been born, Cousin Russ, where I have six possible men that could be her daddy. I may never know. We get on to the next life, and uh, I hope we're in the same place. So I can tell you, I ran into her, <laughs> and what her answer was. She'll be sitting there with her parents. All right. So there could be earlier service, different. So in each of these challenging areas, like possibly incompatible or seemingly incompatible data, there's things that she could see right off the bat. You could look at. That's because this researcher is experienced with military record sets at the National Archives, whether they're compiled or original records. Um, she was just like we're pretty much accustomed to using census records. Um, so clues to be pursued. These fit in with um, other things like who is Lieutenant Hackey, the, ha the fan club. Um, other officers, um, apparently he served under this person and that person. Are we seeing Sanders Ewing um, as people that he traveled to Illinois and settled with? That might lend us, um, lend a, a, a bit of credence to the possibility that, yeah, he really did go down to Kentucky and enlist and he did serve. So that's where the fan club thing comes in military comrades bounty land pension application all these possibilities need to be pursued and then she lists in numerical order the work plan that she would be interested in undergoing now it's 40 minutes into the hour and i agree with you that in our record just the this one document we can add things and take out things, but we probably are going to be doing things like um, seemingly incompatible. Let me move this over and add a to-do list here. And some information that's possibly compatible. 
we'll add the to-do list there and maybe elsewhere. It's your report to yourself and you're acting as professionally as possible. And this is, gets back to what Melissa says. When we actually transcribe it, look at and include in our report why that record set was created. Maybe we've um, learned enough that we know the limitations of that record set, like it was missing the, um, the recruits from January to June of 2014, or, or maybe the part of the index at the beginning of whatever the book was, um, the pages uh, M through um, P were missing. So somebody had obviously torn them out, and you could see that when they're going through, even from microfilm, you can see if a page has been torn out, the page numbering's off. Um, and those are the kind of notations you need to make too. So um, I'm willing to share this Microsoft Word document with you, Gary. I will um, upload it um, if you think this is enough, but I have put that it is derived from Elizabeth Schoen Mills and given you the link. Let me put the parentheses here and that I viewed it. Um, March 20th, 2019, and Historic Pathways is italicized. It would not be fair for me to have created this and claim this as my own, because it's not. All I did was dissect a publicly available research report on one record as Elizabeth Schoen Mills did it. It doesn't mean we can't um, uh, can't add or subtract items as necessary, but I think we've heard from multiple people about um, the importance of each section. Mert, I have a question um, mm -hmm. about footnotes. Yeah, um, it's more of just a trying to get a feel out there. Mm -hmm. um, how many of us doing this for ourselves, for our own research, would actually use footnotes? or include what's in the footnotes in our text. Yeah, the problem is when we copy and paste it to notes in, a, um, in our um, genealogy management program, it doesn't do that for us. It's a big mess. Right, so, so my question is, is that how important do we see the footnotes for ourselves? I think you know I'm trying to say? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm gauging what people think the importance is of that, because I believe it's important. But I'm, I'm interested in, um, you know, if we were to, uh, a professional genealogist doing this for a client, I think we would feel compelled, obviously, to do that. But as an individual, oh, this is just for me kind of thing. Mm. Uh, but I think it's important. Oh, you're making me sick. <laughs> Russ, do you want to respond, Gary? Well, I, I, I know what I would do. I would not do it in my genealogy database management program. But what I would do, because I'm going to create it in a word processor so that I could use the features of the word processor, I would create a PDF file and attach the PDF file to that profile mm -hmm. uh, as supplemental information. I, so I would attach that PDF file to that profile. However, my database program would allow me to do that. So I would take the time to write it, but I would, but I would not per se copy and paste. I would attach it as a document like I would a letter or any other document. I would attach it to that profile because uh, this is the, it depends answer. Mm -hmm. But if I ha had a situation that Elizabeth has presented to us, mm -hmm. that's what I would do. I would create it at, because I want my genealogy database program on a window because that's where I'm going to pull some of my data, my citations, my sources, and mm -hmm. look at the images and then write up outside of transcribing abstracting whatever I need to do to answer the question and then attach that formatted in word processing uh, I would attach it to the profile 
okay, I've done this one time in my personal research. Remember my maternal grandmother who lied about her birth date? And it took multiple documents and um, conflicting evidence. And finally, there was, thank heavens, the delayed birth certificate where the doctor who signed it was the woman who delivered her. So she's obviously, since it was 30 some odd years later, 35 years later, um, she obviously is looking at her records because you don't just remember every baby in the exact moment they were born, et cetera. But it was a delayed birth certificate um, necessary to apply for a social security number to continue working. Um, and I, so here's what I did. I did all my thinking. First of all, I used uh, Microsoft Excel to help me create a timeline. And I could copy and paste that in this document. It's just a table. And it, and it copies and pastes perfectly into Microsoft Word. Then I did the narrative around it. I didn't address it at the top, um, but I did put foot, footnotes because I didn't want all the sources that I looked at to interfere with the narrative of, okay guys, my grandma lied. Here's the evidence where she clearly was the informant. Um, and then she found Grandpa Mike later in life, her second husband, who was younger. And from then on, when she's reporting her age, she's suddenly three years younger consistently. But the family Bible and this and this. And now this from the delayed birth certificate by the delivering OBGYN clinches it. I wanted to be able to have the full impact of that paragraph with footnotes referencing what it was I looked at. I did save it as a PDF and I attached it along with the birth, the delayed birth certificate as um, items associated with that birth fact in my Roots Magic. However, I also copied and pasted that paragraph, that narrative, and put it in notes and said, see PDF attached. Now what I had to do is take out all the one, two, three, four, the, the superscript that just go blah, uh, when you copy and paste it um, into the notes option in the genealogy program. Now, does that part make sense? I think it did for me. Can I offer another reason why you would use footnotes that yes. maybe we don't think about that has happened to me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have done a similar document for myself of a document of research. Mm -hmm. I use footnotes. Mm -hmm. um, I put that down, went on to other ancestors, and it was probably a couple of years before I got back to it. As I'm reading this document and I read the, what, the narrative, mm -hmm. I say to myself, where did I get that? Your thinking changed? Yes. Where did I get this information? And I footnoted it and I looked and I could see where. I got certain other parts of the story. Correct. Yeah, correct. So that that's also a help because I know that sometimes help happens to us. We put it down. We move to another ancestor or something. And then we have to come back to it. Mm -hmm. Or or you've learned about 10 things since the last time you looked yes, at it. Correct. Or, uh, so that you looked at it the second time or third time and you have learned some things that I need to pull that bit of information out. And when I saw it the first time, I didn't think that word was important but when I go learn some new stuff and go mm -hmm. back and look at it that word is key to my problem that I caused my own problem <laughs> well, <laughs> well, because yes, I didn't know it I didn't know at Gary. the time yeah Gary yes I was just going to say that um, I tend to work in at uh, documents in let's call it passes I'll rough out the document very quickly, and that's where I would put in the footnotes for any thoughts I had. And then I'd go back over it and see if my logic actually hung together. Now, without the footnotes, how would I judge the quality of the evidence that I was looking at and the value it had in the argument? Okay, so you're putting your thinking in the footnotes, and I'm putting the citations, essentially, in the footnotes. Because if it's, if it's important enough, and I'm quoting Dr. Jones on this, I've heard him say this several times, if it's part of the convincing argument as to why you believe X to be true, 
or x plus y plus z to be true, or x plus y minus z plus a and b to be true, depending on how complicated <laughs> all those different documents correlated together become. It doesn't go in footnotes. It needs to be up in the body of it so that uh, you're, it will be in that narrative. But whatever tool you use until you arrive at this final um, kind of a report, fine by me, whatever works for you. But think about um, the fact that if it's up in the main body, it's it's has higher import than if you just relegated it to a footnote. Uh, excuse me. It, it's not that I'm proposing that the uh, argument goes in the footnote. Never. Okay. What I'm trying to say is that the uh, to me, I, I think sort of visually, and I look at my argument as being like a, tr a Christmas tree, and I hang ornaments on it. And okay. these ornaments, these ornaments are the pieces uh, are the references that I'm making. And they make the the tree look better. They make it look more like a tree. More interesting. And more, yeah. Exactly. So more fleshed it, out, fuller. Exactly. So what happens to me is if I read through it on the second pass and I see I haven't supported something, then I say, oh, I better go check that. All right. Let's look at Elizabeth. I realize we're not going to get to all three unless we go to eight fifteen tonight. Um, her. This is her page two. Register of, an, of Army, so that's part of a citation, and um, where she got it, and then how to get there. So she's kind of left breadcrumbs, then click on the Adobe icon uh, provided for the publication. The second one is a citation of something from Prologue that explains, so that's a citation. This is it was cat in the page three. This was cataloged in Lucille uh, in the Pendle and Bethel preliminary inventory of Adjutant General's Office, uh, PL 17 from the National Archives. Then we keep going. Yes. Yeah, so without these types of um, notations, you can have discursive notes certainly. Yeah, in addition number, to your citation. Five. She put in. It looks like her own. Um, observation but there yeah. are to suggest time commitments that would place them lower on this priority list yeah so that's a discursive note that but their arrangement but again we're, we're having a citation and now we're looking on page 94 entry 481 on that page as opposed to page 19. Uh, let's see what the notations are here okay pension application um the cemetery's location in the township and range. It was located on the farm of Eugene Laws. We ought to tell John Laws about that. Grandson of Sarah's, of Samuel's daughter, Sarah. The marker was contemporaneous to the death. Interesting point. And, a, and an important discursive note, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because I cannot tell you right off the top of my head when any of my great grandparents um, or grandparents died. Well, I kind of remember one grandmother, but anyway, uh, then there's some little discursive notes about that it was penned in. And then here's an interesting one for the body of evidence that underpins a C file copy of Elizabeth Schoen Mills research notes. And let's go to the next one. All right, so this one is a little more detailed, of have, having to do with um, where the property was and who it was co-owned by and that it was adjacent to Abraham. And that we looked, at, oh, and it's actually complex because we're looking at the deed book for um, 18, page 155, the census for a certain township in Franklin, page 43. Um, yeah, that's a complex citation where it has multiple sources listed. Boy, that's a great example of that, isn't it, Russ? Yep. Um, yeah, so, yeah. This just supports what we know up above. Okay, what have you got, Russ? And then we'll, I think what we'll do is move on to our next example.
Betty Lou says, Melissa, it does not take a f it does not take a few years for my thinking to change because of health issues. My mind changes every few weeks. Uh, now, footnote 12 is more okay. uh, analysis. And Sarah says uh, she also references her research notes and the subject on the subject, footnote 11. Okay, so let's go look at footnote 11. Um, let me first of all zoom in and make this full screen. Boy, this is a fun topic. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's 11. The body of end. Uh, okay, there's that footnote 11. Let's go look at footnote 12. Yeah, that's that really complicated one that talks about multiple documents, um, census, multiple locations, um, land adjacent to, settling in Bedford. Yeah, I hear what you see. I, I see what you are saying there. I thought it was a great example, and I had a lot of fun today and yesterday, Gary, thanks to you, <laughs> looking for prime examples. All right, so I will save this one called a record analysis, and I put underline plan for research. I'll save it in uh, DOCX format, and, um, people can use that. Uh, I will do that and make, when we do our um, blog post about it, I'll include that. All right, so let me go to the second one, which is the house history. Now certainly if we're writing to ourselves as the client, we don't need to do a cover. However, I'm at that stage where I'm starting to realize I don't breathe as well as I used to. I don't walk as well as I used to. I'm not planning to die next week, but you never know. So I'm now thinking I've got to have reports that make sense and are readable and approachable and official looking. And so that's where I came across this. This was by Connie Lenson. So the first page is just a listing of the house history and the address in Portland, Oregon, the date. And because she's a certified genealogist, she's permitted to use the certified genealogist logo there. Then um, she immediately went to a table of contents. Notice though that in her header, it's got the address house history and then by Connie Lentz and CG, and then the date. Let's see what it says on the footer. I think it's just the page number. Yes, okay. Um, I like the table of contents because it made it easy for me to see what the category should be. Like remember the parts in the first one that Elizabeth did where everything was in de or, uh, centered, bold, and almost all of them were underlined. Here's one where under research notes, she added some particulars like who the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth owners of this home were and the approximate date of construction. Then she has something on people who lived in the house and something about the, uh, the last person to own it, um, Carolyn E. Trowbridge. Now to me, the table of contents could have stood by itself and I would have started documents enclosed on the next page, but she's outlined all the things, including county deeds, census records, there's the Polk directory things uh, that I mentioned earlier, something from the Oregon Journal, which happens to be the um, obituary. And if we close your eyes for a minute, it's really nice after all of these wonderful things here, you start seeing the actual documents. Where are they? They're not coming up. Oh, she has the transcriptions of them. I still like the real documents though, mm -hmm. which you will find in the third one. So what she has are transcriptions, I'm now recalling. When if I she, might. Yes? And I was just going to note that the um, the title page and the uh, table of contents and then any other, uh, let us call it inclusions, that, that sounds very, very similar to what I remember of the Chicago Manual of Style mm -hmm. uh, format for a report. Mm -hmm. 
So yes. this one is actually closer to the CMS than, than the one we saw previously. Right. And, it's, and it's dated, but that's dated in 2006, and our vertical has changed since 2006. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, whereas we use Chicago Manual of Style um, as a great way to cite things, um, Chicago Manual of Style has been superseded in the genealogy vertical by um, work that Elizabeth Schoen Mills has done in Evidence Explained. Um, but when it gets to the use of tables, this is the one that I mentioned in the intro, the date of the sale. Um, that was interesting here where it was recorded on a certain date, but the original deed was not found. I think that's a good notation. Who was sold by the original investment company that built the house on spec and who purchased it. And then we begin um, the litany of what, who was listed. You remember that city directories go back as early as like 1806 in some New England areas. And that was a shock to me because when I was a newbie, I thought city directories were the telephone book and it's not. In fact, Cousin Russ does a wonderful presentation on solving a research question using city directories. Um, but um, the one of the advantages of city directories is that, um, well, they'll also give you context of, you know, where the schoolhouse was and the list of all the sheriffs since the city was developed and who the mayors were through time and the main churches that were found there from the beginning of time where the first grist mill was, interesting histories there that you'd think you'd only find in the county history. Um, but then the other, the back half of the city directory is the reverse. So instead of by name or business name, which is the first part of a city directory, it's by address, by street address, and then you can see who lived there. So it makes it really easy to um, find out in a house his for a house history who lived there uh, and what their occupations were. And I've had it where it says so and so widow of, which I loved that. All right. So when I looked at all of the things that she did, and there's something here. Uh, where is it? There's a to-do list that she had, which was maybe we can find a descendant who has a picture of Carol and E. Trowbridge. That was one thing that she suggested as additional research to undertake, um, which is always something we might consider doing with our client or with ourselves. These are things I'd like to do in the future. So let me pull up what I did for that house history, and then we're going to dissect the city directory. Okay, I'm saving this because I added the to-do list. And here we are with the cover. I put myself there. Table of contents, and you can use this because I, if you want to type in the date or the page, like page two or three, ah, should fit in there. You can adjust it. Let's just put three. I did the dot leader for you on it so that it'll be very easy for you to insert the page number. Um, this document's enclosed. I would really like the transcription to be high to to be stated that there's a transcription. In fact, what I like in a report, I wouldn't have done it this way. I would have done the transcription and the document next to it or on the next page because I like being able to look at the original and compare it with the transcript that, the, that I made. Because now that I know the family members better and I know the locations better, because suddenly I'm getting better at North Dakota research or something, uh, my transcription of hard to read handwriting could have changed. All right, that's just me. So then I made the next page that research summary with the subject who we're sending it to, our objective background sounded interesting, 
back in the previous case, it would be, is this our Samuel who lived in Pennsylvania here, Pennsylvania there, Pennsylvania there, and then went to Illinois, who married so-and-so and had three daughters? Yeah. Now, what she brought into play was authorization. And I saw this on several other reports where you are authorized for 20 hours of research. And in your client, if you actually did this for a, a paying client, you would have stipulated it's 15 hours of research and five hours to complete the research report. But believe me, you're not just suddenly writing this up. You're doing what Gary's suggesting that he does. He's doing it as he goes along and then works it through. Um, Alyssa Scalise Powell says, write along as you are researching. Write your report along with the research you're doing. You can always rearrange paragraphs and make bulleted lists and highlight something. You can even make things bold and under uh, bold so that you'll remember to come back to it before you send it to your client or yourself. Um, research limitations is important. We haven't talked about that other than pages being torn out. Does anybody have any thoughts about that? Records not being available online at this time. Okay. So if it was a client you were working for and you only had 20 hours and you found out about a record set um, and it was only available in textual format at the National Archives uh, uh, up in Suitland, Maryland, then that's your research limitation. And under additional research, it would be to hire a researcher who can go to Suitland, Maryland and pull the file and get it for you. Uh, I, would I would also suggest as an archivist who has to do this, um, I've talked in the past about unprocessed records. If you're in an archive and you happen to find out from the archivist that there are some records that might help you, but they're not processed yet, which means they are not available yet. Mm -hmm. You can make notes, um, uh, footnotes, or you could make yourself notes that you need to revisit that and keep in contact with that archive to see when those records are processed. Right. So here's research notes. Um, and that's where I'm reminding you in this form, it, you could insert a table. This is because of it, it's a house history. Uh, Here's the information, and she went through entire paragraphs on what she knew about the second owner and the third owner and the fourth owner. Because it is interesting to an owner of a house who lived there before and what they did. You know, it was the librarian. It was a, uh, the community physician, um, whatever. Okay, just quick biographical. People who lived in the house, that's what she got from city directories. And I did it by dissecting just as we did with Elizabeth. We went into more detail with hers. But I really want to dissect this one with you. So let me pull up the third one. Uh, this is a pro bono, but it is very professionally done. So it fits our topic that we are the client. So this one, instead of um, a cover like a title page of a book, this one's a nice letter from her desk to the friend. And um, apparently Brian's a friend if she's doing pro bono work for him. And uh, the purpose of the report is stated to research, uh, is to document sources, do some searching and give you some results. The body of the report includes extracts, abstracts, and full transcripts of records, and my favorite thing, the record images, all with complete citations, as well as an analyses of the documents where pertinent. So she's basically saying, here's what I'm giving you. Hope you like it. Um, it includes recommendation for a future research, um, 
she omitted when she did her transcripts up here, all the boilerplate language that keeps the report down to, I forget how many pages this one is. Does it tell me? I've zoomed in so much, I don't know. There are also free, we, free we resources available through the public, well, she knows where he lives and what's available at their local public library. Okay, so now we get into a familiar kind of form. The date of it underneath her um, um, heading at the top, the report, um, who it's about, and all she's got for identification about this Pierre is that he was married in 1819. Do you think the M suffices for the average person to know that means married? Well, there's a clue, I think, here in that she addresses it to Brian. Mm -hmm. So that tells me that th there's a relationship between the writer and the client. So uh, I think that th she already has a, an idea of what the client, that the client knows what M means. Okay. So keep that in mind. Uh, so this is the background that he died and was buried in the Green Mountain Cemetery in Balt Baltimore City. Got to say it the right way, Baltimore. But Pierre isn't buried with her. So the wife's there, but he's not there. Family legend holds that he was born in France, came to Balmore from Santo Domingo, now Haiti, in 1790s, when a slave uprising brought an influx of French. So she's giving you the story. And then she's got what documents they know of that was that he probably provided as background, the marriage, so again, he knew what M stood for, and, and the family Bible as well as birth of a son, Alfred Peter in 1820, the client's line of descent, a transcription is provided. Here's where they're authorized for 20 hours of research to be conducted locally and on the internet. Now I said we'd go till 8.15, I've got under, two minutes, just hit the two minute mark. And so I want to show you what she did differently. In her table of contents, she's showing you what types of records she looked at. These are categories of records. She gives you the recommendation for further research. Okay. Then she did something we haven't seen before. She calls it repositories and sources consulted. And you have to remember that um, Melissa is a JD and a Master of Library Science. So she is has a well-trained mind. And so she happened to choose that kind of wording. Now, I doubt she actually went to the uh, Baltimore Sun newspaper office because there's the link to ProQuest where it's archived. However, um, this one's interesting. American and Commercial Daily Advertiser of Baltimore, microfilm held at the Maryland Historical Society. So she clearly went there. All right, so that may be necessary to explain to your client, if, you, if it were a paying client, and I realize we're our own clients, why so much of the time was eaten up of that original 15 hours and then the five hours to do the report because it was 45 minutes from her house each way or it was 10 minutes from her house each way or she hired somebody to do it and here's the bill kind of thing. Okay, but apparently she went to the Baltimore government records that are at the Maryland State Archives up in Annapolis and she looked at these records. These, however, Baltimore County land records are online at MarylandLandRecords.net. We love that website. And then here's another thing. It looks like she went there in person. Um, and signature places an in individual at a certain point in time. So. It made sense to her to combine the list of repositories along with sources, which we think of as a source is a 
document or a photo or something that contains information. So it could be a record of some sort, but maybe that's why she um, put them together because it made sense to show here are the government records, city directories are online, um, these wills and guardian accounts are not online, but these land records are, et cetera. What do you think, Russ? I can hear you breathing. <laughs> well, I just, I wanted to look at her cover page and all of these places, she lives in Baltimore, according to her heading on okay. that first page. So that's, and, and Annapolis is less than an hour away and it's a straight internet, uh, interstate mm -hmm. highway from Baltimore to Annapolis. So it made sense that she probably went to Annapolis once. And mm -hmm. in that description about uh, authorization, uh, it all, it holds true that she did a lot of, a lot of stuff online, mm -hmm. but she went to two repositories. She only went, to, I think she only went to two repositories, mm -hmm. one in town, and the other in Annapolis. Very close, yeah. I've done both of those, so I'm aware of it. She also used a thing called an executive summary, which is, as Dr. Jones would suggest, one of the ways when we were, are writing our proof argument is to state the findings, then explain step by step, taking them through the tiptoe through the tulip, step by step how you got there, and then restate your executive summary or your findings. And uh, she does have a category called detailed findings. And again, when we look at her notes, it looks like um, they looked at uh, laws. She looked at laws, particularly chapter 94, and it had to do with um, for divorce. And something else about, this is Helen Leary's Designing Research Strategies. I love that book. You gotta have that book even if you don't have North Carolina research. And then she went through and she used the use tables to define her um, findings. Makes it so much easier to see. Um, and now we have a very lengthy thing. This is the analysis. She chose to indent the analysis of this uh, and to italicize it, which I thought was interesting. But it doesn't have quote marks, so this is only her thinking. And then she went to the newspaper research. So she decided, the best way to get the point across was to take each record group and, and relate or report on what she found and what that meant. And then she pulls it all together uh, in the executive summary that she has at the beginning of this category and toward the end. But as I say, as you keep going, yes, I can hear you. Somebody wants to say it's, something. Uh, it's Gary. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just going to mention that uh, the structure that she has is very reminiscent of the research notes where your facts are are left uh, left aligned and your mm -hmm. and your own thoughts are indented okay thank you for that um notice that in this particular table she gives you the link to the image at the internet archive kind of intriguing isn't it she gives you the link to this record set, and then you have to get to um, the correct page. Uh, and she gives you the link to the city directory for each one of these years, including the years where there was no entry for anybody with that surname. So see, you're, Gary, I'm really glad that you're part of this discussion because you're research report experience is different from mine and you've expanded my thinking on that so thank you for doing that we all bring this together in this discussion and that's what we hope for okay so if we were i mean seriously 
this would be the part this sent this date report subject background authorization research objectives table of contents including these you need to change what your detailed findings were and recommendations that is the form we would use and you just add and subtract where you need it if you didn't use city directories you wouldn't have that part there would you so what do you think of this um let's see what people are saying um oh deb andrews is saying yeah could be floods burn courthouses in local areas yes records weren't kept all the children were baptized and the couple were married they lived in kentucky in the backwoods and the circuit rider came through only every two years after the spring thaw and the muds had had firmed up all right any feedback before we conclude i'm sorry it's 8 20 but man it's been a very good discussion i've really enjoyed it uh, I'd just like to say that I, I sort of like the one that we're looking at as a research report because it seems to follow a little bit more how we might actually do research, looking at a document at a time and gleaning as much as we can. Mm -hmm. um, the other ones seem to me as if the person had it on their desk or all of the documents on their desk and they were jumping back and forth. This one... I don't know. I sort of like the structure. Mm -hmm. And I, I like the structure of this because of the multiple documents. I like the structure of Elizabeth's first one where we're looking at one document. And you know how we look at a document, a single document, and myriad questions come to mind and alternative record sets to look at. And let's get that down on paper, you know, and uh, it's a way to get the brainstorming on one piece of paper about one document. Um, Deb has a question. What is the name of the author of Designing Research Methods? Is that a book? I don't know. Um, I don't see that as a book title. Um, oh, Helen Leary. Okay, so that was this one resource she looked at. I think it was under footnotes, but I can't remember which one. Yeah, here it is. It's, um, she was editor, I wonder where it is, North Carolina. I actually have the book, but it's downstairs. Helen Leary, Designing Research Strategies. Let me copy and paste this. I'll take out the number two, which was the um, number of the footnote to give you that. And it's on in chapter two, page 20. Okay, does that help? Uh, if Cousin Russell share that with you. Oh yeah, you found the book. But I think we can get it uh, directly from, you can still buy it from the North Carolina Genealogical Society. I don't have a picture of it. Let's go to North Carolina. Um, there we are. Okay, they probably have publications. Member public, let's go to their store. It's like 50 bucks for the book and it's big and thick. Here it is, it's burgundy, $55. Okay, this is the book, the link to buy it. So this time I'm going to give you the whole citation for it and then a space and then the URL to purchase the book. But it's really good if you can get it through your local um, library. It may be that it's, um, well, of course, the Family History Library is the closest one that has it. <laughs> Thanks, Russ, for sharing that link. Okay, might be good.
Oh, you can get a copy of it from Abe Books for thirty-eight fifty. Okay, that's a good deal. Let me give you that link. Abe Books is one you can trust for giving you selling you used books. I can remember when I used to have to convince people that Amazon would not. Um, cheat and use your credit card again and again. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been quite the discussion this evening. Thank you guys for hanging in here so long. Um, I can hardly wait for this to uh, render after I uh, conclude the recording because I think it's been a pretty good subject. And you all have been very forthcoming with your thoughts about what should occur. Um, in a report and how it might be uh, indented and italicized if it's your own comments as Gary feels comfortable with. Um, I feel comfortable with those tables and bulleted items, but we've got three examples. Um, also, Cousin Russ is going to give you the link to the Board for Certification of Genealogists website where you can find under the Learning Center um, their research reports that are either research reports, case studies, family histories, and client agreements. That's how I found the Samuel Whittier. You can also go to Historic Pathways, which is Elizabeth's own website. Most people remember her for evidenceexplained.com, don't they, Cousin Russ? But um, that's uh, another, here's all the thing about Zilpha, Cooksey. Uh, research reports and they're in chronological order. Individual research notes about one person. We haven't discussed that, but I didn't want to do that tonight. Um, and um, cumulative research notes, that one, those get complicated. And a narrative lineage, which just basically looks like an entry for, uh, from NGSQ, the National Genealogical Society Quarterly. So I do recommend uh, we've that you look at both of these resources for additional examples to dissect and then come up with a research report for you that can handle not only the easy and the sort of easy but the really sticky wicket type of research reports that we want to give ourselves as we're doing a professional job, we're climbing our family trees as accurately as possible. We're doing what Melissa said, which is uh, transcribe word for word and get like Cousin Russ is always telling us, look at the background. Why did they create that set? Um, why was that record created? They obviously didn't create it for us, the genealogists who come along later. Um, one other thing to mention. Remember at the beginning when Cousin Russ said he had collected all kinds of information on his Samuel, I forget which guy it was, but when he got to the cemetery record, it directly stated who the parents were. It was there um, in the records and it was there as the plots were laid out with father and mother and this um, particular person there. The information can, uh, that's direct like that could be correct it could be incorrect we're not saying the information always has to be correct you have to weigh the evidence and decide if it's plausible but at this point in time that is cousin russ's current thinking um so nothing left to say but gary thank you for being here appreciate your input and the things that you were teaching me about other kinds of research reports than i have done I appreciate it. Melissa, our favorite archivist, will be meeting with you on the fourth um, Wednesday of the month. Um, find out what's happening in the world of archiving and taking good care of our documents. And Cousin Russ, thanks for bringing in the comments. Appreciate it. All You're right. Welcome. Yes. All right, everybody. On behalf of Cousin Russ, I'm Dear Myrtle, your friend in genealogy. Yes, he really is my cousin. Happy family tree climbing, everybody. That's a wrap.